Not long ago, the chairman of media service provider Netflix stated that sleep was the biggest competitor of the corporation he leads. So is there, is there too much echo here, or should I fo st speak fa farther from the mic? Back. Okay, can you hear me there? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. The development of a revolutionary technology able to remove the vital function of sleep would probably make not only Netflix, Netflix's CEO Reed Hastings content, but also all those of us in search for more time. After all, the idleness of sleep nibbles almost half of our lifetime. It is not a coincidence that in ancient Greece, the deity of sleep, known as Hypnos, was no other than the twin brother of death, known as Thanatos, both the sons of night, Nyx. Can sleep be equated with dead time? These pages belong to a book printing, printed during night time on a mechanical machine now obsolete known as mimeograph. The following text presents some reflections on our printing practice, which poses questions about the meaning of technology, labor, and art. It is also night time now, and we are in Oalvik. We have just chosen to do a residency in this town, as here some of the primal structuring between technology, labor, and nature remain still relatively unconcealed. Located in the west of Norway, Oalvik, has some 400 inhabitants today. The town was built on a small plateau between the steepness of the mountains and the steepness of the fjord. Its raison d'etre is the Vjolvefossen waterfall. In 1905, Vjolvefossen was funneled into a power plant so that it could produce electricity, electricity for the factory and for its settlement of workers, the town of Oalvik. Elkem Vjolvefossen still functions today as a foundry, producing ferroalloys for the iron and steel industry, as it did since the 1920s. The plant is at work day and night. A few decades before the Bjolvefossen waterfall was funneled into a power plant and mimeograph technology was envisioned, Karl Marx put forth a critique of capitalism of unparalleled influence. Labor, technology, and time are key concepts of his critique. In one of his earlier works, Marx remarked, and I quote, time is everything, man is nothing, he is at most time's carcass, end quote. The notion of time is always present in the process of printing with an obsolete object. The time of the machine, the time that links us with that chain of human beings who conceived, produced, and used the machine. The time of mimeograph printing reveals itself as a radically different time than that of both manual and industrial printing. Marx 
gives an account of the historization of the means of production. The hand is the means of prehistory. The tool, that of the era of manufacturing, and the machine, that of the modern industry. As described by Marx, the machine has three components. First, the motor mechanism that puts the hole in motion. This motor can be located either outside the machine, as it is the case with natural resources such as wind or water. The motor can also be located inside the machine, as it is the case after the invention of the steam engine. The transmitting mechanism is the second component of the machine, according to Marx. So the transmitting mechanism is in charge of regulating, dividing, and distributing the motion from the motor to the working machine by the use of wheels, ropes, gears, and so forth. The third and final component is the working machine itself, which performs the operations that were formerly done by manual work and mostly uses altered versions of the tools originally made for handcraft. The mimeograph lies somewhere between a tool and a machine. The motor mechanism can be either the manually operated crank or the electric motor. The transmitting mechanism distributes motion to the spinning drum or drums and depending on the model, motion can also be distributed to the feeding and receiving mechanisms. The original handcraft tools that the machine incorporates are the silk screen, now mounted on drums, and the impression roller. The machine basically replaces the paper feeding and the inking and rolling over the master to make the actual impression. The other tasks, the rest, need to be made by hand. In his 1951 book, Minima Moralia, Theodore Adorno puts forth the idea of barbaric ascetism. Barbaric ascetism as means of resistance against both mass culture and progress in technical means in order to restore an unbarbaric condition. In a way reminiscent of artist William Morris, Adorno anticipates that, I quote, no work of art, no thought, has a chance of survival unless it bear within it repudiation of false riches and high-class production, of color films and television, millionaires, magazines, and Toscanini, end quote. The older media appear as a rejuvenated means to incarnate Adorno's notion of barbaric ascetism. I quote, they alone, the older media, could outflank the united front of trusts and technology." End quote. The concluding lines of the passage extend the ineluctable fusion of mass culture with both progress and barbarism to the realm of the publishing industry. In Adorno says, books, have long lost all likeness to books. The real book can no longer be one." End quote. Adorno finally discloses what interests us the most here today, which is the role of the mimeograph. He says that the mimeograph is the only suitable means to repeal the barbarism of progress and this is how he speaks about it. 
I quote, if the invention of the printing press inaugurated the bourgeois era, the time is at hand for its repeal by the mimeograph, the only fitting, the unobtrusive means of, of dissemination." End quote. The section of minima moralia discussed here is significantly entitled Pro Domo Nostra, which means for our own sake or for our own cause. The stickiness between mass culture and a conflation of barbarism and progress that Adorno describes with aversion is a phenomenon that Adorno himself would see perfectly illustrated by Netflix today. Over a century and a half ago, Marx spoke of time being everything and man being nothing. And 70 years ago, Adorno wrote about the barbarism of mass culture brought about by technology. Contemporary with Marx, artist William Morris, a writer, printer, and bookmaker, was also concerned with technology and labor. As well as Adorno and Marx also often did, Morris chastised technology. And I quote William Morris, those almost miraculous machines, which if orderly forethought had dealt with them, might even now be speedily extinguishing all irksome and unintelligent labor, leaving us free to raise the standard of skill, of hand, and energy of mind in our workmen, and to produce afresh that loveliness and order which only the hand of man, guided by his soul, can produce. What have they done for us now, those machines of which the civilized world is so proud? Has it any right to be proud of the use they have been put to by commercial war and waste? Some of the ideas conceptualized by Morris resonate in Adorno, but also in another philosopher, Martin Heidegger. These three thinkers point at different degrees of incompatibility between two sets, the set of technology slash commerce slash capitalism and the set of art slash thought. The three of them seem, seem to point out that there is a sort of inverse proportional relation between these two sets or even a relationship of exclusion. Prompted by Netflix's CEO Reed Hastings statement that sleep was his corporation's biggest competitor, we began this text discussing about sleep. We pointed out that Hypnos, sleep, was the twin brother of Thanatos, death, in Greek mythology. In spite of this genealogy, an important different difference set both twins apart. While the god of death, Thanatos, was childless, the god of sleep, Hypnos, was a prolific father. Hypnos gave birth to 1,000 children, and these children were no other than the dreams. Residing in the underworld, the dreams that were called Oneiroi flew every night from their abode to deliver dreams to us, mortals. During their flight, they were confronted with a decisive moment, the moment of traversing what the Greeks called the gates of sleep. There were two gates, the gate of ivory and the gate of horn. 
flying through one or the other gate would produce dreams of the opposite quality. Those traversing the gates of horn, those traversing the gates of ivory delivered deceptive dreams. Those traversing the gate of horn would, on the contrary, deliver true dreams. A beautiful passage from Homer's Odyssey has Penelope explaining all this to Odysseus, whom she believes to be a stranger rather than her very husband. Penelope says, Stranger, dreams verily are baffling and unclear of meaning, and in no wise do they find fulfillment in all things for men. For there are two gates of shadowy dreams, and one is fashioned of horn, and one is fashioned of ivory. Those dreams that pass through the gate of sun ivory deceive man, bringing words that find no fulfillment. But those that come forth through the gate of polished horn bring true issues to pass when any mortal sees them. Dreams cannot exist without sleep, and technology cannot exist without dreams. It is through the labor of artists that collective dreams are fathom. Artists, the masters of the techne or techne. Curiously, the word that we use today to refer to this conglomerate that we call technology, that word originates in art. Saying technology, techne plus logos, or techne plus logos, would be something like saying artology. In ancient Greek, techne or techne meant art, and also craft and skill. In his influential essay, The Question Concerning Technology, written almost at the same time as Adorno's mini memoralia, Heidegger begins by stating that the worst possible way to perceive technology is to perceive it as neutral, as this makes us particularly blind to it. The non-neutral character of technology is somehow clear here in Oalvik, the small town in Western Norway. Technology helps keep our workers far from smelting furnaces, several workers told us during our stay in Oalvik. New technologies, including remote control operations, have removed human work previously done in the proximity of reduction furnaces operating at 1,600 degrees. Having drunk from the river Lethe, we have forgetfully forgotten not only that the origin of technology is in art and dreams, but also that the, the truth itself is aletheia. The Greek word for truth will never be the same after Heidegger. As it is known, aletheia is a concept central to Heidegger's philosophy. Heidegger elaborated an original philological interpretation of aletheia namely to oppose it to the idea that truth resides in the correspondence or representation of a knowing subject and a known object. Heidegger maintains that the original meaning of aletheia is, as in the presocratic philosophers, disclosure 
or unconcealment. This digression about Heidegger's aletheia will make more sense soon as we continue our discussion about sleep, dreams, technology, art, and from now on, also truth. We just made a somehow obscure remark about the river Lethe. Technology, forgetfulness, art, dreams, and aletheia. Let us start with what we can see. The words aletheia and lethe have much in common. Basically, aletheia is the same word as lethe with an A or alpha added at the beginning. In Greek mythology, the Greek, the river Lethe had a magic effect on people who drank from it. It made them forget. It had the effect of oblivion. The name of the river comes after the noun Lethe, which means forgetfulness, as well as concealment. Aletheia is then nothing else than A plus Lethe. The initial A in Aletheia is a negative prefix known as alpha privative. So literally translated, the word that expresses truth in Greek would give something like unforgetfulness or as Heidegger understood it, unconcealment or disclosure. We can then state that aletheia is that what has not been forgotten, which would be the equivalent of saying that it is that what is remembered. As we remember from early paragraphs, Hypnos, the god of sleep, was the twin brother of Thanatos, the god of death. Thanatos was childless, while Hypnos had a thousand children, the Oneiroi. Dreams, deceptive or true, are delivered by the Oneiroi, who carry them from their abode through either one of the two gates. The Oneiroi, I said, to reside in his father's, their father's rocky cave, deep in the hollow of a mountainside. It is at this site that the Greek Greek mythology brings together the dreams and forgetfulness, where the river Lethe flew by the dwelling of Hypnos. Memory is the antonym of forgetfulness, and mnemosin, memory, the divinity antithetical to Lethe. Unlike Heidegger, who emphasized the idea of unconcealment and disclosure in Aletheia, we focus on the idea of unforgetfulness and memory in Aletheia. Working with an obsolete machine as the mimeograph in the 21st century brings back Adorno's idea of barbaric ascetism and Morris's veneration of the skill of the hand. Printing on a mimeograph today entails searching for those who used this technology in the past, for those who made and maintained the machines, for those who built the skills to hand etch temperamental and fragile wax stencils. The approach to equipment in supplies is imprinted by a different mindset. Always pressing for exceptional care, for handling material as precious, and above all, for thriftiness. We can see something similar here in Oalvik, where Bjolvefossen waterfall is still part of the landscape, as well as the remains of buildings from the beginning and mid last century in the factory and in town. And from their 1st of May 
parades that perhaps only in this town are more important than the main Norwegian national holiday. Memory is ineluctable here as it is in working with the mimeograph. Significantly, mnemosine, memory, was not only what we would like to call truth for the Greeks. Mnemosine was also a mother. Mnemosine was the mother of the muses. The muses originally told poets what they were to say, aiding them to render words in a beautiful form. Later, the muses were believed to be a source of inspiration not only for poets, but also for the arts in general, and also for the sciences. Just like the Oneiroi, the muses are divinities whispering into the ears of mortals. Whereas the muses brought mostly truth or memory, the Oneiroi could bring either truth or deceit. We hope that these words will somehow inspire this wonderful conference that we have just begun. The muses will whisper into our ears during these two days, speaking to us the words of memory. Perhaps we even want to reconsider the long time abandoned epistemological theory of Plato. Plato who believed in reminiscence Plato, who believed that we were all born with all knowledge. We just need to remember it. Human knowledge, the knowledge of humanity, the platonic truth that Heidegger relentlessly defied, the truth of the humans and not of things. Thank you very much. Um, many thank you, many thanks, uh, Branko, for the first paper that's been read today. So we thought we would, um, after each talk, we would uh, open up to a short Q and A. So I don't know if, if anybody has any questions regarding uh, Branko's or Garbar's paper, or in general, perhaps if you have any questions regarding our work, the work of Garbar. Uh, early morning questions, not the easiest. <laughs> Particularly after uh, um, a lovely paper discussing sleep. <laughs> uh, so I'll pass over to Haven. I'll give you, the, if you have any questions, I'll give you the microphone, which is uh, great for the, the video that we're producing for the conference. I'm interested in your, in your talking about sleep and sleep as something that um, can provide clarity um, and symbolism, but also perhaps lack of sleep might be something that um, we, should, we should embrace uh, as we're doing art and printing because that seems to be part of it. Um, and the disjunctures of lack of sleep may be something that actually add to us. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience with that? Yeah, so uh, the paper intends to be um, contradictory in a way because technology is contradictory. So what we were trying to do with this paper was to just pose some of the questions. So the paper starts being quite aggressive against Netflix. Uh, but then it says very quickly that this paper has been written during night and printed to be printed 
uh, by us during night to for a book that will be made during night. I would be happy to say more about it, but. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Again, related to all Gabwa or, uh, or the paper, the group. Okay, so to Lawrence. Hi. Hi. I enjoyed what you had to say. Yeah. Um, a couple of things jarred on me personally, not, not because you were wrong, but because of my own personal ideologies. Um, the reference to inspiration, you know, I spend my life telling people not to use the word inspiration. And I was thinking of Plato, and I spend my life trying not to think about Plato, and I prefer to speak about Aristotle, or think of him. Um, if we are not remembering what we in some form already knew, what we are doing with our science and our art, and I'm thinking of them as, as one thing, we're inventing. We're not hearing from someone else. We're in some way making it up. I was thinking how I could express this, and I remembered from somewhere has come a memory of Yogi Bear running off a cliff and his feet keep going along the line and the cliff has gone. He stops in midair, looks down, sees the problem, takes a pencil and draws the ground under his feet. Wonderful. And then <laughs> runs on. Oh. And I think that that one of the, coming from that, one of the, the not dangers, but, but one way that we can mislead ourselves is taking too, much, too seriously, that's the wrong word, but too fully, the Morris and the, 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 the idea of, well, that's barbarity and we're re returning to origins. And we should stress, as artists and as scientists, our ability to invent, to make new knowledge. Okay, it's got to come from somewhere, but I, I don't like the idea of inspiration. I don't like the idea of anyone whispering in my ears, uh, unless they're nice, but, but I, I just don't think there is such a thing. And, and it jars on me when I hear people say, oh, what is the inspiration? It's a bit like when, they, when perfume makers refer to creation, and they mean made. And I think when people say, what was the inspiration? Too often they are meaning, what was the idea? I've spoken too much already. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Do you still want to ask her? Ah, I thought you said... Ah. <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> Hi, thank you. I, I thought that was really <laughs> very beautiful, actually, mm. paper. Um, do you, do you, could you say more about the productive, I guess, if that's the word, um, time of night time? Um, if, if that's what what I've taken or understood from your talk about this idea that it's a time separate from other time. If, if, I'm, if that's making sense, um, that for some reason, the fact that you wrote the paper at the night time and printed it at the night time, what, I guess, could you expand a bit more on that? And I imagine you've maybe read about other artists or scientists who work at night and how that relates to printing? Well, I think it's um, primarily the, the beauty of being able to concentrate because there is, there's nothing else. It's just you and your book or your machine. But I think that's what happens to everybody, maybe. It's just the time alone where there's less noise around. 
Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe the, if there's one last question. Does anybody question, have one last question? Does anybody have another question? I thought I would just, uh, uh, okay, great. So just pass over to Jane. Branko, I thought your paper was really beautiful and I really enjoyed it and it actually made me feel like I was in that space, that, that split space that you were describing, the nighttime space, and I think this is really obvious what I'm saying. But um, I kept thinking the whole time about the, the Netflix guy and what he had said and it seems to me from what you were talking about, you're making really explicit something that's actually very simple but but we forget to really think about this sometimes, is that sleep might be his enemy, but he is hypnotizing people, society. And through that hypnotism, he's actually ensuring that there is no creative space anymore. Because I look at my daughter's friends who barely ever sleep and struggle to be creative at such a young age, because actually they're endlessly hypnotized by their screens. And I was very interested the other day um, on television when um, uh, there was this uh, a program which was the, who was the greatest icon of the 20th century. And Alan Turing, sorry, Alan Turing was voted by the British public as being the most iconic person. But actually the person who explained why we should vote for him asked the audience to hold their phones up and he said, look at that, isn't that beautiful? That's what he gave us. Mm. And I, I get it now, I got goosebumps. So I kind of, <laughs> I really relate to what you're saying, but I do think also that hypnos and hypnotism go very closely together. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, just to say a last quick thing, um, is that uh, some of the idea behind that we were trying to put forth somehow or imply um, is that there is kind of an oxymoron between the claim of this technology-based company trying to remove sleep when sleep is the source of the technology itself. So that was our claim, that there is no art without dreams and there is no technology without sleep. So it's like uh, he would be killing the source of all creativity and technology if he removes sleep. Thank you very much. Okay, many thanks. Thank you.